Okay, I think we can start, right? I'm guessing. Okay, so we're gonna talk, going to talk about, this is a bit misleading title. We're going to talk about uh, managing resources, platforms, and so on and so forth, and what happens after the first day ends. Um, that's going to be a twist later on. Anyways, a uh, quick introduction, right? This is me uh, during the Q&A session. Uh, so I dare you to ask me questions. Kidding. Uh, I work for Abound. I have a Twitter account. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. Okay. There. And we have Katarina. <laughs> Hello, everybody. I'm Katarina. I'm a platform engineer at Dynatrace. I'm super stoked to be here with Victor today. And yeah, I think we can skip over the rest as well. Okay. Let's uh, let's go with the talk. Right. So, right. Everybody likes sitting here. Otherwise. You wouldn't live. Anyways, um, <laughs> cooking, eating, stuff like that is very, very similar to what we're doing in our industry, right? Um, if you want to prepare a meal, you need to find all the ingredients you need, right? And for some of those ingredients, you're going to go to a supermarket next door. For some others, you're going to be adventurous and go to woods to find mushrooms or to the market and so on and so forth, right? When you need to prepare a meal, you need to gather all the ingredients first and then assemble them all together, right? That's how cooking works, and that's pretty much what we are doing in our industry as well, right? You need to figure out to find the cables for networking, servers, disk drives, uh, and so on and so forth, right? You need to find all the pieces, and each of those pieces do not mean much individually, but when you put them all together, you get something meaningful. You get a cluster that can run your applications. You can get databases, you get this or that, right? It's very similar to cooking. Now, uh, since a long time now, right, we don't anymore go in to the shop to buy servers, cables, and so on and so forth. Some of you might be doing that. Some of you might be running your own data center. That's great. But we got a new thing, new thing like 15 years ago, 20 or nobody knows when, called cloud. That is pretty much giving you similar effect like going to very, very big supermarket to shop for ingredients. You get the menu, you choose what you need. Do you need networking in AWS? You get networking. Do you need storage? You get storage. Do you need a server? You get a server. Now, the problem with that approach, not the problem, but all those are designed in a way that they give you, most of the time, not always, individual ingredients, individual components, so that you can assemble something that is exactly as what you want, right? Uh, because otherwise, Google Cloud and Azure and uh, AWS could not predict what is it that you need in advance. They give you ingredients. Uh, and then you, ops person or DevOps person or platform engineer, or whatever we call ourselves these days, you would actually assemble all that together, uh, probably after receiving a Jira ticket saying, I need the database for yesterday, or something like that, right? You're assembling all those ingredients into something meaningful, into a meal, or in case of what we're doing, let's say a database, or whatever you're, you're, you're supposed to assemble. Now, that is very different. That menu, this what... Uh, providers give you right now ingredients is very different from the experience when you go to a restaurant, right? And that's the experience that developers are most of the time expecting today, right? They don't know what is exact, what are all the ingredients, what are all the things they need to assemble to get a burger or a soup or whatever they want. Uh, they want a ready-to-go meal. They wa I want a database. Don't ask me about VPC and subnets and what's not, right? So that's usually what we consider today being platform engineering, right? You understand the ingredients, you're the cook, but you're not offering those ingredients to everybody else in a company. You're assembling them into certain number of choices, right? Burger against soup or whatever the meals are. A database, a cluster, a backend application. Now, what we are going to do first at the very beginning, and you will see it will change drastically later, we're going to use Crossplane to see one quick example, because what I want to talk about is not really what, what I'm going to do now, but I just need to get there somewhere. 
So we're going to use crossplane. Crossplane is a way how you can create a control plane, how you can create that menu that allows people to choose what they want. And behind that, you know what the recipe is. The something equivalent of a recipe would be what we call compositions in crossplane that will assemble all those different ingredients to create something meaningful, right? And you will see that in, in very, very soon. Now, <clears throat> what we are going to try to do today is uh, I'm going to follow the, the example of being in a restaurant, ordering a dish instead of ingredients, uh, and try to see how we can make developers feel, get some very, very similar experience with our services. So we're going to skip the setup. Boom. Wrong button. There we go, because we did that in advance. And we're going to do two things, three things first, right? We're going to create a cluster, uh, because cluster is required to run something. We're going to create a database. We're going to create an application. And then something bad will happen, but we'll get there. Yeah. She's going, she, she has dual personality today. She will be acting as a <laughs> developer first, and then something else. But we'll get to that something else. Right, so here we have an example of a cluster, right? Uh, this is a cluster that, think of it like ordering something from the menu uh, with some special requirements. Uh, a person, imaginary person here, she would say, hey, I want something in AWS, I want it to be EKS, I want medium-sized nodes because I have no idea what's happening in AWS. I want it to be three nodes, I want some namespaces, I want traffic to, have, to be installed in the cluster, and I want that cluster to be populated with credentials so that I can access AWS from that cluster, right? Now, I don't have time to show you all the magic, all the ingredients behind all that. Uh, find me after the talk, I can show you the, all the thousands of lines of YAML and some other code in it. But the point is that as a developer, you just say, what do you want from the menu? One of the items in a menu is a cluster, and create a cluster. And Katarina is going to create a cluster now, probably. We didn't rehearse. I'm not 100% sure what will happen, but we'll see. <laughs> uh, there we go. Cluster AWS Dorham in the namespace something, A team, right? And that creates a cluster. And if you want to see what are all the ingredients in this specific thing that you ordered, uh, we can do cross-plane trace, uh, and you will see that uh, all the components that are in this cluster oh, are listed sorry. there, right? This is what is happening in the background as a result of you invoking, creating an instance of something. We call that composite resource. So a bunch of things happening there. That does not matter. What does matter is that it takes approximately 20, 25 minutes uh, to create all the components required in AWS. It's a bit slowish. Uh, so what we're going to do is we already created the same thing in advance. We are faking it a bit today, right? Uh, so the same manifest that she executed earlier uh, was executed before this talk. And you can see, OK, now we have the cluster. It's all up and running. I don't care about any of those things because what they really ordered is a cluster, so let's just move on. I'm not sure what's next, so I need to discover. Uh, there we go. Yeah. So the next thing is a database, right? And that developer, Katarina, needs a database. That's another cross plane composition that creates custom resource definition in Kubernetes that allows us to uh, create resources based on it, and then behind the scenes, things will happen. And in this case, uh, we're creating SQL claim uh, based on AWS. It will be Postgres version 14, medium size. There will be database in that server, MyDB. Um, since that server will be created in a management cluster, we're going to push the credentials of that, of that database to a secret store in AWS. And then we're going to pull it in a different cluster, the cluster where application will be running, the one that was created a few minutes ago. And there is some SQL schema that will be generated in that database, right? So that's fully operational Postgres database with all the banks and lease whistles, with users, with everything, with authentication moved to a different cluster and with schema. <coughs> so 
We're going to fake it again. Katrina is going to apply that manifest. It takes, you can see, if you do cross-line cross trace, we can see what are all the components involved in um, running that database. There we go. Uh, all that stuff, since it takes time, 15 minutes, we did a copy of that in advance. So we're going to fake it that we fast forward it for those 15 minutes. And we should have the, there we go. Database fully operational, all the components, all the ingredients are there, ready. Now, there's one more thing missing before we get to the real part of this talk, which is, you'll see what it is. Anyways, uh, I will need an application. There is a definition of an application. This now was not done in advance. We are doing this now because uh, it doesn't take much time to deploy application. I'm saying again, I don't know what are deployments and service meshes and virtual services and this or that, right? I'm abstracting application into something called up claim, a couple of parameters, run it in that namespace, use that image, that's the port, that's the host, uh, and uh, do it in that cluster that we created earlier, and connect to the database using the secret of that database so that you can speak with it, right? So now if you do just kubectl apply, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, or some other things, there we go, Sorry. apply. Uh, and if we do the, do the trace, you should see that the application is running, right? Uh, and it will be connected to the database and it will uh, automatically happen. I think that I'm using Dapper behind the scenes and so on and so forth, right? Those are the resources that were created. Uh, you can see by the name what it is, na the deployment namespace and so on and so forth. Now that's all great, right? That's what most, Many teams, not in this, not using this tech, not using those tools, but that's what many teams I speak with do when they think about platform engineering, right? How can I enable people to create stuff, to update stuff, and to delete stuff in an easy way without them spending 75 years learning Kubernetes, AWS, and everything else in between? Uh, now, if you go, yeah, there we go. Um, look, look at it, we already did that. The problem that we are having, if you consider platform engineering being just uh, be enabling people to operate, is that they end up being blind, right? That they can maybe see some basic things, maybe the status of what they created is true or false or something like that, but most of the time they're blind. There would be like, imagine the restaurant where people are having, being blindfolded, and then you don't even know whether your meal was served, whether the plate is empty, whether you got something, what that something is, and so on and so forth. But what we're really needing is day two operations. People need to be able not only to create resources that they need in an easy way, but also observe resources. And that ob observing resources need to be tailored for specific use cases not some generic dashboard that works for everyone and go figure it out, but dashboards and data created specifically for the services that they're instantiating. And I think that this is where I pass them. There we go. And she's not a developer anymore. Now she knows about observability. <laughs> yeah, now I know. And I actually asked my question, what is so bad about those blindfolds? A few years back, I've been in a dark restaurant. Everything was completely dark. We got served a surprise menu. Um, blind waiters were actually bringing it to us, and it was a lot of fun. So why is this so bad in our situation? Well, the big difference is a few years back, I was having fun with my friends. In my free time, I'm up for, expect, uh, for adventures, um, embracing the unexpected but definitely not something I want to have at work, and definitely not something I want the developers I'm working with having to face, because it would be the equivalent to this situation. Let's just think about you're building an app, you're running it in production, everything is running fine, you're moving on to the next features, but suddenly an angry customer is calling you, and they say that this and that feature isn't working, you have to get your stuff together, you have to fix it right away, and you have to leave everything behind. This is already where the first problem happened. It was actually a customer informing you that something is not working. 
while it should be the other way around, that you are noticing that something is going on and that you can proactively react or proactively do something about this, inform customers, and by that already soften the situation. But too late for that. So you continue troubleshooting. You have some logs, but they don't really tell the whole sto story. You maybe get alerts, but way too late. And it's super hard to pinpoint the root cause and by that also to fix the issue. So what can we as platform engineers do about that situation? How can we make this better for developers? In my opinion, one of the most important points to get this right is to allow developers or to enable them to trust your platform. Because by, um, by building up trust between the developer and our platform, um, they can actually deploy with confidence onto the platform. And how can we do that? One very important point, transparency. Developers need to, go, need to know what is going on in our platform. Um, is the platform up and running? Is a problem they are facing maybe related to our platform? So we need to be transparent about that. We need to give developers insights to the platform and then later on do the same for their applications so that they can be confident and trust their applications in the end and avoid this situation. Um, this problem is also very much reflected in the Dynatrace State of Observability report of this year. Um, in there, 88% of tech leaders have claimed that the, tech, that, the, that the complexity of their tech stack has been growing in the last 12 months, and about half of them is thinking that it also will grow within the next year. About 86% have claimed that their tech stack is causing an explosion of data that is beyond humans' ability to manage. And 81% said that configuring monitoring tools and analyzing data is distracting teams and is actually slowing down innovation. And what makes all of that even worse is that only 9% of applications are fully instrumented for end-to-end -end observability. The gist of all that we have a huge problem. The complexity of our systems is growing. We don't have proper monitoring or observability configuration because it's hindering innovation. It's slowing us down from getting features out. And that results in very few applications being actually instrumented. So I think, or at least hope, that we can all agree we have to do something about it. And what we can do about it is making, uh, is making observability a key goal of platform engineering. And according to the State of DevOps report from Papad in 2023, already nearly 40% of applications have defined observability as a key goal of platform engineering. So we're definitely not alone with this opinion, but still it's less than half of companies that really focus on observability in their platforms. So what we did today is we built a demo to show you how you can integrate observability to your platform to avoid your developers sitting blindly in a restaurant hoping that they will get a meal one day, maybe also not. Um, and I will show you that soon. Just one very quick slide before that. I want to quickly talk about what observability actually is. Um, Basically, observability goes beyond traditional monitoring. Because back in the days with monitoring configuration, we were always expecting some errors and were then creating dashboards and alerts for those errors. So basically, we could handle known unknowns very well. But we had a problem if an error happened that we couldn't expect. So a so-called unknown unknown happened. And in this case is where observability really shines. Because observability, combines data from various sources, um, mainly metrics, logs, and traces, but it can be way, way more platform sources to get data from, to analyze it, and then to prepare it in a nice way to the user, help troubleshooting, um, inform them about problems, and so on. Today, we are going to use DinoTrace for the demo. Um, it's obviously my tool of choice, but all the concepts we are talking about are applying to any other observability tool as well. So. Okay, let's get started with the demo. So you've already seen those crossplane beta trace commands that we executed. It's a great way while developing crossplane compositions and trying them out to see if everything is up and running as expected. But still, you don't want to have this as a troubleshooting tool in production, right? I mean, I love using it, don't get me wrong. 
but you always have to connect to the cluster. You need to have credentials, and also you need to know your way around Kubernetes to actually then troubleshoot the resources. So let's see what we have in Dynatrace, actually. Um, in here, we first of all have a Kubernetes application. And here you can see we have, oh, I should probably make it a bit bigger. Bit bigger. Um, you can see that we have two clusters here. Why do we have two? Well, actually, we first deployed the cross plane observability demo cluster, which is just a local kind cluster. And this one is our control plane. This is where we deployed all the resources earlier in the demo too. So the application, the cluster, the database has been deployed, has been deployed to that one. But then we also have the 18 cluster, which is the one that we just created during the demo, but faked a bit, so created a bit earlier because it just takes some time. Um, yeah, just those things are just because I wasn't connected to internet earlier, so don't get distracted by them, please. But let's open the 18 cluster. And in here you can see already we got a very quick status of the cluster. We have zero problems, everything is up. We have two vulnerabilities that we should definitely care about, especially because yesterday it was just one. Um, we have CPU and memory stats in here. We can click around, we have like a few more charts. Um, we can see if there are any problems like on the first glance and so on. But still, if I'm a developer, if I have no idea what's going on, this might be a bit hard for me. So what Victor and I did is we went ahead and created a dashboard that is basically an entry point for the developer. And this is a very simple dashboard now. It just shows, hey, do we have vulnerabilities? Um, are our, all our nodes and pods healthy? So really nothing special. But what it also shows is that this cluster overview dashboard can be customized to your clusters and to your needs. But the question you're all probably asking, where is this coming from? The nice thing, nothing I'm showing you is created manually. So everything has been created with um, Crossplane. And if we now go back to the terminal, and I show you the cluster that, or the configuration for the cluster. Oh, sorry. And I show you for the, the configuration for the cluster that we actually deployed. You will see that suddenly there is a Dynatrace configuration in here. And this is because Victor very nicely added Dynatrace configuration to the cluster composition. So it's like one more ingredient that we, add, that we are adding to our big recipe. And you can see it's enabled. We need to pass the ID of the tenant or the URL of the tenant that we want to create the dashboards and the Kubernetes clusters on. And we need to pass some credentials. And that's it. Those four lines of YAML is all a developer needs to do to get this dashboard and the Dynatrace configuration. So quite doable, I think. And what we also can do with that is for different clusters, we have different people using them. So the A-team cluster is a developer cluster. It's used by developers to deploy their workloads. But for example, the cross-plane observability demo cluster, so our control plane, is used by platform engineers. So what we did is we created actually this overview dashboard that you already know. But we also created a crossplane metrics dashboard that gives us more details about what's going on with crossplane, especially, for example, like the average time to readiness that I like to use um, to check if everything is working as expected and so on. So by that, you can provide different levels of information for different users because not everybody can handle the same amount of information and not everybody needs the same amount of information. Okay, we did not only deploy a cluster, right? We also deployed a database. So pretty much the same story. We can navigate to the Clouds app and select databases. And in here, we will see that we have, yes, this one it is, a Terraform database or a database that is called Terraform. And again, we can click around, we see some metrics and so on. So where is that coming from? Um, same thing. But in this case, not the cluster, but the database composition. So if we open the db.aws, you can see again down here, we have a Dynatrace dashboard configuration. Not much more configuration. We are enabling it again. We are pass passing credentials. And we're giving it some information about the application. So which cluster, Kubernetes cluster is it running on? How is the app deployment called? Which namespace do we have? And a Slack channel, which we will need later on. And again, 
that's all. I, as a developer who doesn't know anything about the internals of our platform, have to do. And this result in the cloud app I just showed you, but also, again, in an application dashboard that we created to give developers a first insight. In, oh, sorry. In an application dashboard that we created to give developers a first insight in their application. Again, it's just a sample dashboard, but we have in here vulnerabilities, we have application stats, and also stats about the database because they belong together. You also see the latest logs here, but still, everything is a bit boring, right? So let's go ahead and generate some load. We have prepared something on DDoSify, and what we do in this test plan is two steps. The first one, we are creating a video with a post request, and the second one, we are getting all videos. So let's hit next. Let's be very, very brave and do 10,000 requests in 20 seconds because, sorry? 100,000, okay. It's a live demo, right, so. Okay, let's click next. We are sending them from all over the world because we can. Let's save it. And let's start it. And this is now running and sending all the requests that I just showed you. And while it is starting, I hope that we can already go back to Dynatrace and actually observe what is going on in our application. This is maybe a bit of too much of a time frame. Let's change it to 30 minutes. And yes, we can actually. So here you can see that we already have many traces for our application. It's in that case, many get requests. I hope I can also find a post in here. Let's see. Not yet. Then we will just use one of the get requests. And now we have a very, very, very simple trace because we have a very simple application, but still it's good enough to show the idea so we can click on it and we can get information about what's happening. We can see, hey, somebody did a GET request to our application. It resulted in 200 OK. Um, it's running on port 8080 and a bit more like request headers, timing, logs, and so on. Um, and by that, we already have much, much better troubleshooting possibilities than the developer we talked about in the first scenario. And we actually also need it because if you saw the notification up there, in the meantime, we got a message from Dynatrace that we have multiple application problems because maybe we have been too brave during the presentation. You go, you go brave and you die. <laughs> um, yeah, so we can click on that. We can utilize everything we just showed you to troubleshoot that problem. And basically what we wanted to do is we wanted to show how you can really make observability easy for the developer by integrating it into your platform. And with that, oh, sorry. And with that, ultimately, remove those blindfolds, give everything the meals that they want to have without being scared of the meals suddenly disappearing or having something inside that you don't want because you know exactly what is going on. The waiters know exactly what is going on. And I think that's the situation we should aim for in our companies as well. And with that, at least from my side, thank you very much. I don't know if you want to add something. Questions? Anyone? About anything, life, universe, no? Ah, there's one, yes. Uh, to break, break the application? Uh, oh, yes, yeah, so, so uh, I used actually Go, Go templates to write part of my compositions. Yes, because now Crossman supports uh, functions which allow you to define it in any way you like, as long as you provide the output back to Crossplane. Yes. What do you do if it's a network? If it's a network, you should see it. You mean if it's a network that prevents you from seeing the dashboard itself? If the network is problem, you should be. 
if you did the observability in terms of dashboards, you should see it there, and you should be notified, assuming that... Um, you want to answer? Yeah, ass assuming that you can access the dashboards themselves, right? Now, if your network is messed up, that you cannot access that either. And assuming that also you did observability in a way that if you cannot reach something, that's a bad thing, right? Ultimately, you can do something like, what's the service? Uptime that verifies whether your dashboards is accessible as well. Anybody else? Um, I think back there is one question. I don't know. I don't see. Yes, yes. Yell, scream. <laughs> through the CLI. Um, so I'll try I to think... summarize, and you correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, when I executed crossplane trace, we saw uh, uh, crossplane resources, but can we add Dynatrace there as well? Yeah, something similar to that. And also when it comes to other uh, 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 crossplane resources, so for, so, so for example, when, when a function is run, let's say, if you could really see what what exactly happens, what, what exactly the cross-play controller, let's say, um, has executed, and uh, yeah, and what you, trigger for those. Uh, not necessarily, you cannot see all those things from the cross -plane trace command because th that there is a limited space there. Yeah. But generally speaking, if you, if you describe the resource, uh, any resource, including resources that are, for example, creating dashboard, you get events of what's happening in statuses. Yeah. Yeah. And you could import those into dashboards as well, which I think that is what uh, Katarina did as well. Exactly, that's just what I wanted to say. So Crossplane is great in emitting all information it has in events. And you can read all those um, events in Kubernetes and then with the Dynatrace query language, you can actually process them. You can also create workflows, like when you notice, hey, there's a new claim, you can like get the things underneath them. Um, it's a bit hard to do. I'm currently trying it and I'm getting there, so it is possible. Um, it just like requires some trial and error and failing and hopefully succeeding in the end, but it's definitely possible. Okay, thanks. Can you show the setup again? The setup? Yeah, the part that you skipped. <laughs> uh, the composition. Ah, the yeah. setup, yes, yes, yes. Um, so. Uh, should I show the script or the commands? Yeah, the not the setup section of the slides, I think. Was that the question? Yes. Yeah. Uh, so whenever I create slides, I always put setup, even though I'm executing in advance, so that if you f want to follow the same slides, you can actually get to the same point. And there's a setup. I like Nix. So there is Dev DevBox that spins up all the tools you need, and then probably creates a cluster. Setup SH actually creates everything. Thank you. If you Very do well. that, I have to apologize a bit. Um, there are a lot of Dynatrace steps that are not automated, so you click, need to click around a bit in the UI, but you can get a tem demo tenant to also do that. And maybe I will have time in the future to also automate those so that it's less clicking. Two more? Okay, I heard two more questions is what we are allowed. There's one, one hand, two hands, I don't know. Pass the mic, throw it. <laughs> uh, maybe I could go first. If, uh, Yeah, maybe a silly question, I'm not sure, uh, but uh, would we be able to do the same setup you did or something similar, but not using Dynatrace, maybe some other uh, solvability tool like, I don't know, Grafana? Definitely. I mean, I, I haven't used Grafana too much, to be honest, so I'm not quite sure about the internals, and I'm sure the Kubernetes app or the Clouds app are different there and behave differently. But building dashboards, adding them to your composition, as long as the observability tool you're using has an API that you can actually add in your composition and that you can call, you can do this with any tool you want. Also with non-observability tools, if you want to do something, you can have a lot of fun with it. One of the, one of the takeaways from this talk, 
uh, among others, not the only one, is that you can assemble resources whichever you want in, in compositions, right? And they, they will be orchestrated and created ultimately one way or another. Last question, probably. There we go. Sorry. Maybe not a question, but observation. So essentially, we did the same by building our own composition, simply injecting, you know, custom instrumentation stack, also security scans and things like that. So, you know, crossplane is pretty powerful in terms of what you can do in terms of building your own compositions. So, good stuff. Thank you. Thank you. Is that it? Are we finished? Yes. Going to kick us out? Absolutely. <laughs> okay, then we go.